for urban horticulture. So I've always looked at the University of Washington as being a leader in horticulture education across the U.S. I got, had a chance to see her uh, Center for Urban Horticulture in September when I was in Seattle. It's very impressive. So Dr. Reichard has worked in invasive plants for a long time. She's one of the few faculty I know that have had graduate students that were asking questions that I was asking and trying to figure out the answers to. So she is going to talk to us today about it's 2015. Why are we still planting uh, invasive species? So thank you, Dr. Reichard. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the invitation. I This is my Second time in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area this year. I was here in June for the American Public Garden Association's meetings. I don't know if anybody of you were at that. It was back in June, so it looked a little different then. But it's interesting because aside from being at the airport and changing flights, I've never been to this area of the state before. And I've been here twice this year. So okay. uh, universe is speaking. So as Mary said, I'm going to be talking about um, why are we still planting invasive species? When I started working in this area in the mid to late 1980s, we didn't know very much, and it was pretty understandable that certain things were being grown because we just really didn't have that information. We're decades into research on this, including you know, research of some of you in, in the room, too. Uh, and so we know quite a bit. And so why are we still planting invasive species? And what I want to cover are three things in particular. Uh, first of all, can we assess the risk of plant invasion? So is it a completely stochastic, random crapshoot when we introduce something and anything could become invasive? Or can we actually assess that risk? Um, the big question of the day, are sterile cultivars the answer? And I, I think some of you are probably working on that. You may know more than I do about it, but I'm going to give you my opinion anyway about what are the answer and the cautionary tales. And then finally, the really fun part, which is selecting alternatives to invasive species, which gets to be get you to the nurseries. So it's great. Okay, so um, those of you that have had some population biology or advanced uh, ecology may have learned some models for population growth that involve all kinds of really fancy uh, elements to it. But when you strip it down to the basics, this is uh, what, what those, pop, those models mean. So if you want to know the size of a population at some time in the future, you need to know the size of a population at a baseline time. And then factor in the number of births or germinated plants or um, vegetatively propagated plants minus the deaths, uh, stress-related deaths, uh, uh, density um, uh, dependency. And then also look at immigration and especially emigration out. Uh, really focusing mostly on these two traits for invasive species because one of the things about invasive plants is that they are really good at reproducing and they're really good at tolerating stresses. And that gets them through a lot of the uh, environmental stochasticity that plants in the wild experience. When we talk about those traits of uh, high birth and high and low death, we're talking about basically intrinsic growth rate. The, the growth rate the species can, serve, uh, can grow at uh, based on those characteristics. And so this little cartoon is just showing if you start out with a population at that same baseline time, if it has high intrinsic growth rate, so it has high reproductive and, and good stress tolerating traits, you will likely see the population increasing over time. If it does not have high intrinsic growth rate, if it's a poor propagator, if it doesn't tolerate stress, chances are even if it gets established, it will wink out over time. So really focusing in on those reproductive traits. So uh, as Mary said, this goes, I've been looking at this for a long time. This actually goes back to my dissertation work. And it's just to point out, you can do statistical models, which I use discriminant analysis. And you'll notice that a number of these traits that were pulled out, some of them are biogeographic. Uh, some of them are this cold chilling of the, the seeds for germination, uh, actually negatively correlated with invasiveness, veg reproduction, minimum juvenile period. Those are re reproductive traits. Semi-evergreen leaves, as well as evergreen leaves, can be good stress-tolerating traits because the plants are able to photosynthesize um, in the wintertime. So looking at all of those, and you come up with a, a fairly highly predictive model with um, an asymmetry of prediction of being able to predict the uh, invaders much a much thank you at a much higher rate than the non-invaders, um, but overall it's pretty effective in being able to do that. However, discriminant analysis model is not exactly an easy thing for most people to work with, and especially back when I was working on this in the 90s, where it was pretty much all well, it still is largely voluntary, but it was voluntary, and to expect a nursery company or botanic garden or concerned individuals to actually use a statistical model was not realistic. 
So then I came up with a decision tree, and some of you may also be familiar with this. The idea with this was that it would be something that was more accessible, that people could actually begin to do their own risk assessments. And uh, again, a little bit of biogeography, some phylogeny in here, uh, more biogeography, a little bit of reproductive traits. This is just the top half of the decision tree. You get down to the bottom part of it, and again, you pick up more of the, uh, the reproductive traits, juvenile period, uh, seeds requiring pretreatment, and those kinds of things. So pretty easy to, to follow and to figure out. And instead of just invader or non-invader, it had three predicted um, group memberships. So um, you have the uh, correctly uh, predicting 85% of the invaders and only 46% of the non-invaders, so not a very good symmetry. But quite a few of the, um, of the uh, I can't see very well here, sorry. Quite a few of the, uh, the, um, the ones that were classified as non-invaders um, the classified as invaders were actually non-invaders. Okay, so those were mine. Um, then about the same time that I was finishing up my work on this, Paul Falong came out with a, a model from Australia. And he did a little bit different approach with this. He basically did a, an Excel spreadsheet, and there were 49 questions on the Excel spreadsheet. There was uh, traits of climate distribution, domestication, uh, whether it's a weed elsewhere, desirable, undesirable traits, the plant type, reproduction, dispersal, and persistence attributes. And if a species scored less than one, it's not a pest, greater than six, it was a pest. So it gave you a very clear uh, way of, of looking at this. This is just, again, pulling out reproduction so you can see some of the traits that he thought were important um, in this. Uh, so looking at the questions on reproduction, whether or not there is reproductive failure in its native habitat, its ability to produce viable seed, uh, hybridizing, self-compatibility or apomictic, and apomictic means that it can produce seeds without fertilization uh, from pollen. Pollen requires specialist pollinators, because obviously that's going to hinder plants in a new environment. Uh, reproduction by vegetative fragmentation, so some sort of uh, um, tip layering rhizomes or something like that, and then minimum generative time, a uh, number of years that it's in a juvenile state before it begins to reproduce. So this has been tested for general applicability in uh, a number of places. You can see all the way from New Zealand to Florida, the Czech Republic, and Doria Gordon and her colleagues looked at it and uh, grouped, um, Grouping them found them to be 90% accurate in predicting invaders and 70% accurate in predicting non-invaders, 80% accurate overall. So this is going to be disappointing news to some of you that are nursery owners or wanting to introduce plants because 70% accurate with non-invaders means that we're potentially keeping out 30% of the plants that you want to be able to introduce. Uh, and so that's, that's not good. 80% overall accurate is good, but we have this problem with asymmetry in all of these risk assessments where it's easier to predict invasiveness than it is non-invasiveness. And that may reflect many things, including the many different ways that a species can be non-invasive, uh, whereas invaders tend to have suites of characteristics that are very similar, reproductive and uh, high reproduction and high stress tolerance. Um, so this year, we published a new paper. This was published in March, on March uh, 24th, 20 this year, 2015, in PLOS One. And uh, this was work that started with one of my graduate students, Dr. Elizabeth Seabacher, and then was carried on by Christiana Conser, who's working with Jody Tommaso at UC Davis. And with this one, we took a, a, we try, what we were trying to do again was get what I was trying to do with that decision tree, which is make it something that's tangible, that, uh, that somebody, perhaps a nursery owner or a botanic garden can realistically do and have high accuracy. Um, so it was a little bit different, and a lot of weed risk assessments are referred to as WRAs, or weed risk assessments. Um, the group that we were working with on this, which I'll tell you about in just a minute, uh, did not want to use that term. They wanted to use pest risk evaluation, so PRE. So it's a little bit different title, but it's uh, basically it's a weed risk assessment. It was the group that funded this wanted to stand out and be different, I think. But, um, but it was, it's an interesting process, and we're pretty proud of the model that we came up with. So Elizabeth Seabacher started with 56 original questions. They were things that, questions that I had come across in my work, that Paul Falong and that others had come across, things that might be related to invasiveness. 
Uh, she tested them on 21 invaders and 14 non-invaders, a relatively small pool. Um, and I should mention, when we do non-invaders, we usually go back several decades to make sure that they have been around long enough that if they were going to become invasive, they would have become invasive. So we're looking at that lag phase issue. Um, she eliminated those that had little predictive power or are hard to answer. A lot of these are really kind of hard to answer, particularly if you're working with a species that isn't terribly well known. Uh, and so a lot of them require a fair amount of research. And if you end up with a lot of blanks, it can really affect your accuracy. So getting rid of those questions that are really hard to answer is, is really a, a good thing to do. Uh, so doing that, she pared it down to 19 questions and tested it on 56 invaders and 36 non-invaders. Uh, the questions break down to um, about four of them being biogeographic, uh, related to invading elsewhere, and what sort of impacts they have when they invade elsewhere. Two of them were climate matches, uh, both of the native range and the invasive range. Uh, three dispersal questions, looking at uh, vegetative dispersal, uh, number of seeds, and viability of seeds. And then uh, eight re reproductive, including vegetative reproduction. And again, this, this stresses that Reproductive ability is one of the reasons that invasive species are so invasive. And then two looked at ecological or human health risks. Okay, so um, this is what the results were. So it was highly predictive in 93% in predicting the invaders. Four, four of those were evaluate further. It had 100% success in predicting the non-invaders. And that's what was really encouraging about this study. Uh, we had three people doing each species using the PRE and came up with very similar results. Uh, we were also monitoring the, the length of time that it took people to, uh, to answer the questions as well. But this is the first time I've seen this actually happen in one of these risk assessment models where we've been actually able to correctly predict the non-invaders. And in fact, when you look at the way the, the scores came down, um, the four that would be evaluate further were here at 13. Uh, so if, we, if you slightly slide this range over, then actually it would be 100% of the invaders would be correctly predicted as invaders too. So, um, so this model has a lot of uh, potential, I think, to, to allow us to actually accurately assess the, uh, both the invasive and the non-invasive plants that are being introduced. So I wanted to say a little bit about the group that sponsored this work. I don't know if you've heard of Plant Right. I see a couple nods. So a few of you have heard of this group. It's in its 10th year now. It's a project of sustainable conservation, which is a nonprofit based in San Francisco that chooses projects where they partner with industry to deal with uh, conservation issues. And so 10 years ago, they took on invasive species, planning to only do it for a few years and get the project started. And then I think they got kind of excited about some of the results that we were having, and, uh, and now it's sort of institutionalized. So uh, one of the things they did, they spent, it's, it's really interesting to work with a group like this because they have a, a model that's very successful. It was actually started by someone who was instrumental in starting the Nature Conservancy and then kind of broke off to do the sustainable conservation. And it's really about um, building community and consensus. So for the first couple of years, you can't see the list of people, it's just too small, but you've got you know, the, um, the nursery trade, of course, you've got botanic gardens, you've got plant uh, landscape designers, landscape mm -hmm. architects, um, the seed trade industry, the floriculture industry, pretty much anything you can think, anyone you can think of in the horticulture chain, as well as nonprofits and, uh, and, and academics. And we spent the first couple of years getting together and just talking about invasives and what they were and getting different perspectives and uh, uh, going and visiting each other's sites. So we took, um, we took a field trip out to the Point Reyes uh, National Seashore and you know some of the nursery people who just are their hardworking nursery people, they didn't get out to Point Reyes very often, were like, oh my God, Ketoniaster, I never knew it did that. So it was very helpful in getting them out there to actually see, oh, okay, this, this isn't just you know a bunch of academics and environmentalists who have their head in the clouds. I can actually see that there's a lot of Ketoniaster here. But just as usefully, it took people like me, the academics and the nonprofits, uh, the environmental groups, to um, the seed trade industry and to Monrovia Nursery's biggest wholesale grow out place, where you begin to realize the amount of investment that these companies have in the species and that they are, um, it, it really matters when we say something is invasive, it really can affect their ability to, to do their work. 
and to survive. I mean, many of them are fairly small businesses. And, uh, and so it was, it's been really useful in getting to know each other. And it's really built up a level of trust that I have not seen in any other group that I've worked with because they took the time on the front end to educate all of us about all of us so that we all kind of knew the perspectives. And we became friends. They have two core projects right now that are going on. One of them are nursery surveys. And so they've been doing the nursery surveys now five years, four years, something like that, but enough where they're actually starting to collect data and trends. And so that's a very encouraging model. And it's one that we're looking at in the Pacific Northwest because they've kind of worked out the details. They use mostly master gardeners. They train the master gardeners. They have you know very clear reporting. Uh, so that's a great project. And then this pre is the other one. And what they're trying to do with this, and I don't know, they've been going around and talking to people. So some of you may have been at a conference where they've talked about this. But what they're trying to do is do these assessments on plants. Uh, if you were doing some research on a plant or you're planning to bring something in from, um, you know, South Africa or something, well, you wouldn't hear. Uh, it's a colder place. <laughs> China, parts of China. Okay, sorry, we do South Africa. You guys go China. Um, so colder parts of China that, you know, you can have them do the risk assessment. And if you signed up to be um, a part of them, then you, would, you, you could request them to do assessments for you. You'd have access to all the assessments that have been done before. It's an interesting business model. They're just trying to launch it. I'm not sure it's going to work, but I think what they're doing is really innovative, and I applaud them. And it's worth taking a look at their website, PlantRight, and, um, and just taking a look at what they're doing. So the one thing I want to say, first of all, in talking about switching back now to talking about weed risk assessment, and that it is successful, and we can predict invasives and now non-invasives with fairly high accuracy. But what are we really predicting? And what we're really predicting is this, that this is, we're, we can tell you the likelihood that this introduced species will move from just introduced and into the establishment phase and begin to invade. So we can tell you these species have the biological traits and the biogeographic traits like invades elsewhere that give us some clues uh, that it is likely to, be, to establish. Does that mean that it's going to then expand and really have impact in high numbers? That's a much harder thing to predict. Because with that, you really need to consider the invaded ecosystem and the traits of that invaded ecosystem as well as the traits of the invader. Uh, a nitrogen fixer is not going to have a strong impact in a nitrogen-rich environment, but get it into a sand dune or a prairie grassland, something like that, it can have a very high impact because it's introducing a new resource that wasn't there previously. So my caveat with all this good news that I've just given you that we can predict invasive species is that we're not really predicting impact. And that's going to be a species by species assessment of where you're introducing the species and what kind of resources it brings and exploits. So the bottom line for this is that we do have tools to evaluate new, introdu new introductions for invasiveness. Um, we do have the highest predictive power for likelihood to escape cultivation. And predicting impact is a little bit harder. It's a little bit less of a blanket approach and more of a, OK, now we know the species is likely to establish. What sort of impacts is it likely to have? And of course, you can look at impacts it's had in other places where it's invaded if it has invaded somewhere else. But you also need to look at your situation here in Minnesota or wherever you are and you know, what you think that impact might be on the resources that you have currently. So next I want to talk about sterility in hermaphroditic plants. And I imagine there's probably some people in this room that know more about plant breeding than I do. So if that's true, and I'm sure it is, uh, the caveat is that these are my impressions and my learning of it. And I'd love to discuss with you further if you have other experiences. Uh, I was heavily influenced by a bioscience paper that was published in 2011 by Tiffany Knight, as well as some colleagues um, in the Chicago area. And one of the things that they said that really struck me in that paper was cultivars, per se, do not invade. Their offspring invade. And that's where it gets a little bit harder, because you need to be thinking about, you know, OK, you're planting this cultivar out there. You know that it probably won't do anything. But how is it going to be interacting with other individuals of that species that might be around? Uh, can there be environmental triggers that would cause sterility to be reversed? Uh, and, and, um, and I'll end up with some um, matrix <coughs> modeling, which I thought was really interesting in this paper. So sterility in plants happens. It can happen through naturally induced mutations. Um, it can also be induced, um, natural or induced mutations. 
and uh, most commonly it is male sterility. So there's little or no pollen, uh, less viable pollen that's produced. Um, it still could be passed from the mother plant. Uh, the the uh, um, fertility can be passed from the mother plant, and it still can produce seeds if other pollen is available. So, you know, you guys are probably familiar with this purple loose stripe is the first real big case where we saw this happen where, you know, yay, we've got a sterile cultivar for purple loose strife. And yeah, it was until it came in contact with other cultivars or wild populations where the pollen was viable, and then you got seeds. And that's, I think, what happens all too often because male sterility is the most common form um, of that. Having said that, there are stable male sterile uh, cultivars out there, and, and maize is a good example of that. Um, and uh, so this is probably pretty hard to read, but basically, if you start out with uh, the, the maternal plant uh, being male fertile and the paternal plant being male sterile, you get a, a heterozygote, so you've still got the dominance of the, uh, the male fertility. But as you get down here and you're starting to, to cross the, the, uh, the heterozygotes, you'll end up still with some male fertiles. It'll only be 25%. The rest of them will be either heterozygotic or homozygotic for sterility, but you're still going to have 25% uh, male fertility out there, uh, pollen being produced. Uh, I mentioned that corn is a, an example of stable male sterile, and that's because the, uh, the male sterility is cytoplasmic. So in this case, the, the mother um, is male sterile, and so that makes it more stable. So there are cases where male sterility is uh, still going to be um, stable. Female sterility would be even better, and that's where you have no or reduced ovules or death of pistil uh, prior to pollinization. Uh, it's relatively rare, unfortunately. You just find it in a few families and very few um, species. So female sterility is great, but we don't see it very often. Uh, hybridization is very common in plants. That's how a lot of new species have come about is through hy hybridization. Uh, a lot of uh, the hybrids are polyploids, which are... Um, higher than diploids, uh, up to se estimates are up to 70% of angiosperms are polyploids. There are a number of traits that are associated with polyploidy that seem to advance invasive species. There might be uh, larger flowers, uh, more vigorous growth, uh, things like that that are associated with polyploids. And as we get into looking at polyploidy and invasive plants, we're finding that many of them are actually um, polyploids. And um, just to show you, you have to have uh, homologs for the different uh, genes to pair up. And one of the things that can happen is, is triploidy, where you get three, and so then it's hard for it to pair up. And we do find that, that um, the triploids are mostly sterile. So developing triploid cultivars might be a way of getting at that. They still can produce fruit, but they generally don't, um, and they still can produce asexually. It's like dandelions are able to pre reproduce apomictically, and many of them are, are triploid. But it's a, another path towards getting towards uh, Sterility, and here are some examples of some triploid fruits that we commonly eat that generally don't produce seeds. Uh, so the points of night at all, the main points, are that claims, this has been the first part of the paper talking about claims of fecundity are often not well substantiated. Uh, for instance, you might be some studies that are looked at Budley, I'll pick on Budley or Davidia because it's a big invader for us in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and there's been a lot of claims of sterile cultivars of Budlia, but when you look at them, it's male sterility and it's really limited. Uh, if there are other cultivars present, they usually are able to produce fertile seeds. Um, the offspring of the cultivars may behave differently than, uh, than um, the cultivar type, and they also can become fertile, as I said. And then the last thing they said, which was really interesting, was that even large reductions in fecundity can result in population increases in long-lived plants, particularly woody plants. And, uh, and that was, this was an eye-opening study for me. So they did matrix, mo matrix population modeling. Uh, matrix models look at all stages of the life of the plant, not just seeds, not just adults, but all stages of it. And you usually get some sort of a model that looks like this and gives you some sort of probability for each stage. So you can have seeds be seeds. They can stay seeds in the soil seed bank, or they can germinate into seedlings. Seedlings can become juveniles. Juveniles can become small adults, medium adults, large adults, very large adults. They can also just stay as juveniles. And you can see each way you go, um, 
there is the ability for it to just stay as it is or to actually go to the next stage and you know produce more seeds. But it's, it's really interesting when you look at these long-lived species, they are, even if they're having a fairly sharp seed reduction, uh, enough seeds are building up in the soil seed bank that they actually can become invasive. So in a matrix model, as you look at all life stages, you're solving for lambda. And basically, a lambda of greater than one means that you have a growing population. A lambda greater or lesser than one is, means you have, the population is, is shrinking. These matrix models really got their start looking on rare species, and that's where I mostly worked on them because I also work on rare species. Um, looking at, you know, what, how, how fast is the population decreasing? Uh, is it decreasing or actually growing? Um, what they found is they did a meta-analysis where they looked at uh, cases where there were published studies of matrix modeling being done on invasive species, both woody species and uh, herbaceous species. And in their findings, they found that all of the trees and shrubs studied needed, um, needed 95 to 100% reduction in seeds to achieve a lambda of one or less. So it has to be pretty much completely sterile. Otherwise, you're going to have that soil seed bank building up, and you still have the potential of the population growing. Yeah, it's a little bit, when you include the, um, the herbaceous species, it's more about 50% seed production, which is probably more achievable. But when you're looking at the long-lived species, particularly the, the trees and shrubs, 95 to 100% seed sterility. And, and so the point I was trying to make with earlier is that it's really hard to achieve that with any certainty, especially going forward into other populations and, and other, uh, into the future where there may be hybridization of pollens from one cultivar to another. Uh, so they're setting the bar pretty high here for really saying that something is a, a true sterile cultivar. There's some other cultivar considerations, too, though, that I, I want to mention. Um, some cultivars have very high rates of, of variegation or re reduced leaf surface. Think of, like, one of the big uh, invaders for us are ivies, the English and, and um, Atlantic ivies. Uh, the wide-leafed ones are very invasive. The needle points, there's actually a couple of cultivars which we found that are a little bit invasive, but they're not the ones causing the problem. They usually have a slower growth rate because they have reduced leaf area or uh, variegation, so less chlorophyll. Um, there can be production of non-flowering plants or elimination of pollinator rewards so that they're just pro uh, pollinated less. And there's the possibility of uh, biotechnology and transgenic methods. And I know that some people are working on this as well for some of the cultivar considerations. So the bottom line for this is some cultivars may be less invasive, but the sterility is often less, uh, is often reversible. A reduced seed set is nearly, uh, needs to be really total for woody invasive plant species, but you may be able to do something like look for cultivars that have a slower growth rate or do not produce as many flowers or things that, uh, you know, that may be related to the fitness of the plant. But the bottom line is really that claims of less invasive cultivars really need to set a fairly high bar. I think we're at a point right now in our work on invasive species where there's a lot of interest in sterile cultivars. And I think it's really important at this stage that we get it right. Because if we don't get it right, then going into the future, there's going to be more skepticism. So I think there's a rush right now, especially with Bodleia. There's a rush to find a lot of, of um, sterile cultivars. And I think if we, if we rush that right now and we blow it, then I think there's going to be even more blowback on it. Okay, I'm going to finish up with the uh, the fun part, which is identifying alternatives. Have any of you done this? It's really a fun process. Okay, it's really a fun process. Um, so uh, a few years ago, um, a group of us got together. It was right before Christmas. It was actually right about the same time. Uh, I think it was 2005. And there was a, a, a grant opportunity, and it was for producing some sort of a publication that had something to do with conservation. And so we came up with this idea that we wanted to research alternatives to invasive plants and, uh, and publish it in a booklet form. And I've actually got it. Oh, no, it's in the car because I left it in my bag, darn it. Uh, but this, we produced this publication called Garden Wise, which is 32 pages long. We decided to do it this way because years ago, I went to a conference in Australia, and I picked up all kinds of different publications and brochures, uh, and one of them was a publication from New England, which was, I mean, uh, New Zealand, which was a, a booklet like this. 
I don't know where all those other pamphlets went, but that booklet earned a place on my bookshelf. It was something, it was just too much for me to throw away. And so I ended up coming back to it. So we decided, okay, we're not going to do it just a brochure. We're going to do this whole booklet. And, uh, and we're going to put it out there. So we got the grant. And then we ended up having to do the work, which it turns out, again, it's really funny because you get to go to nurseries and, uh, and have a good time. So steps to doing that. The first one is that you need to understand why people want that species. Picking on Buddleia again. Um, they might want it because it's a good attractor for butterflies and hummingbirds. They may want it because it has purple flowers and they really like purple flowers. They're also fragrant. Um, they may like it because it's summer flowering and there just aren't as many summer, summer flowering showy shrubs. But what we found was that there's different reasons for why people are attracted to these species. And so you need to go through and enumerate which each of those are because you may not be able to do fulfill all of them in one other species. But if you can say, well, okay, don't go to this one for attracting butterflies and hummingbirds, but look at this other one that I've got available for you, then uh, you can speak to what they want to do. So um, in the case of the butterfly bush, uh, we then looked at alternatives. And I think there's a rush to always choose native alternatives for these non-native invaders. And I think that's not really responding to what people want. We may want them to be growing more natives, but they're not necessarily with us on our agenda here. So, uh, so you need to provide both. And what we tried to do for each of these species is provide three alternatives that met some of the criteria that we found they, people, why people like them. And, uh, and then recommend them to people. So, uh, so there's some natives and non, at least one not native, and then usually two non-natives, sometimes two natives. So, for instance, for this one, uh, Physocarpus capitatus, it's a native shrub, is a butterfly attractor, it's summer flowering. Okay, it's got white flowers, it's not a showy, it's buddleia, but it still has pretty flowers and it attracts butterflies, and it's native. Uh, Vitex agnus castus, the chase tree, is one that really fits all the, the buttons. It's a butterfly and hummingbird attractor, it's got purple flowers, in the summertime, um, looks very similar to it. Actually, has a much better form than Bodley. Bodley has a terrible form, and the chase tree actually has kind of a nice architecture to it. Uh, this one, though, is becoming invasive in Texas, so there's a little bit of a caveat there, but so far we've not seen any problems with it at all in the Pacific Northwest. So, and then the next step is to verify that they can actually find these plants in the nursery and that the nurseries can find them from wholesalers or that they're easily propagated. Um, some of the first efforts we did with this, we were like, cool, let's recommend this really neat thing that's really hard to propagate that nobody has, you know, and so you just frustrate people. So, um, so that was one step. We realized we needed to include the nurseries and actually find out if they were actually truly available. And then the next thing that you need to do is get the word out. So like I said, we found that producing this uh, publication really made a huge impact. We produced one, this is just Western Washington. We've updated it once and we're getting ready to update it again. Uh, in addition to the alternatives, there's also information in there about invasive species, what they do, how to contact your, um, your county noxious weed board, you know, those kinds of information as well. Uh, and it's been used now in Colorado and Oregon, also has a similar publication. Uh, that one, I think Oregon says Garden Smart. And it's like, really? <laughs> we know you're copying us. It's okay. You can use the title too. Um, but it's it's really been neat because you go to the information desk at nurseries and you'll find these really dog-eared copies of this because they're really using them. And so if you guys, I don't think you have anything like that or I probably would have seen it. I looked on the web and didn't find it. But if you're thinking of doing something like that, it's a really, um, it's a fun process and it's been really useful and it's been really good at getting the word out for us. So the bottom line uh, for this is that determining alternatives to invasive plants is really fun. And you get to talk, get together with your plant geeks and you talk plants and, you know, you look up stuff and it's really good. Um, I would, in doing that, as I might suspect, recommend staying away from sterile cultivars of that particular species and not go there just yet unless you really are convinced that the sterility is not reversible. Because, again, I feel concerned that... It, I mean, I'm sure you guys have heard about the purple loose strife example over and over and over again. And how long ago was that? Like 25 years? But it's stuck in people's minds. And I think it's really important for those of us that are working in this to be really careful uh, about it, or there's just going to be a backlash against it. Okay, so I probably talked too fast because I'm from the Pacific Northwest, and that's what we do. I need to slow down. Um, but you guys seem very calm. I'm always impressed when I meet Minnesotans because you 
you just have this sort of serene quality about you. <laughs> You're also really, really friendly and polite, so thank you. I was really struck at all the way from the airport in. Everyone was so nice. Um, so conclusions, uh, we do have accurate tools that allow us to predict now both invasiveness and non-invasiveness. So there's no reason that we should not be evaluating new introductions for this. You may have heard about the changes in quarantine 37 in the federal government and that they do have some new risk assessment methods and it being the federal government, the new risk assessment methods, while more accurate, are just as cumbersome and ridiculous as the old ones. Um, so uh, they're not really doing those. I mean, I think there was a lot of excitement when Q37 was changed to include plants for planting, uh, not just plants for, um, for propagation, but actually the plants that we're gonna, you're going to be selling to the homeowner. Uh, but in fact, it really hasn't turned out to be all that great. And, uh, and they're not doing that many evaluations on the federal level. Uh, and so it's still really useful to have these tools that we can use as um, people that are recommending plants uh, and people that are growing plants. Um, sterile cultivars do exist, but the bar must be set very high for the type and the extent of the sterility. Um, let's not overclaim this. And determining non-invasive alternatives provides assistance to both nurseries and their customers. What we're trying to do is provide tools so the PRE is a tool that can be used to prevent the introduction of invasiveness. Uh, cultivar evaluations and sterility, that's another tool that we can provide information to people on. And determining the non-invasive non uh, alternatives, again, is another tool that we can offer to nurseries, to homeowners, uh, and to others. So I guess I come back to the original question was, it's 2015, why are we still using invasive species? Okay. I think I've got time for questions, too, so. <laughs> questions? So why are we still growing invasive species? Just yep. a comment on the terminology around sterility. There's a Midwestern um, invasive plants and trade working group, and that's one of our, like, there's going to be a subcommittee formed on that to really oh, that's try to so great. out that terminology so that we don't started calling it the S word. Like, we, we just are trying yes, not to say it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I'm going to use that. But um, we haven't worked out good yeah. terminology for that yet, but it's certainly a goal so that we correctly describe um, the invasive protection. That's so useful. And could you, when you guys do that, could you get it out there, like through the Invasive Plant Council or something? Share that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it would be great to have a dialogue about that because it's something we're all facing. And like, I will say with the, the pre, uh, um, so I love sustainable conservation and plant right. They're really wonderful. They love their tool and they want their tool to be able to predict sterile cultivars. And I keep telling them that it's not sensitive enough to do that. And that, you know, they're going to make overclaims, but they're really excited about it. And so they've just submitted one of the USDA multi-state specialty crop grant proposal. Some of you may have been involved in it too. But they've just submitted one that's looking at using the pre-tool in different states around the country, but they also want to use it for sterile cultivars. She just sent me the narrative yesterday and I just rolled my eyes because I already said you can't, you, it's not sensitive enough to do that. So um, I would love to see some good terminology for this so that I can show them that it's not me just being negative. That I'm just trying to be cautious about this. So thank you for doing that. All of the risk assessment tools that you've described um, seem to concentrate solely on environmental harm. And there is a ASTM process underway right now. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm familiar with that. that. I'm involved in oh, great. representing the green industry. Great. And we're a little bit, we really want to keep talking to understand how these lists might get used. And to before we agree with the ASTM yeah. standard, make some connection between who gets to build the list and what it looks like mm -hmm. uh, and how they get used. Because we have constituencies here in the state of Minnesota who would love to have a tool that would provide legitimacy to a process that they could then use to say, these are the bad plants, we're going to ban them. And we in the green industry are just a little scared of that. Yeah, I, and it's, it's not just here. That's nationwide. I'm hearing that from all the nurseries, uh, uh, the green industries, that they're really concerned that, you know, everyone's making a list and that, you know, uh, a list that a university extension service, you know, makes is the same, has the same validity that a list that a, you know, garden club makes or something like that, that there's 
there's not that. And I think that's a valid concern, but I do think we have the tools now to give those lists that, uh, and the one thing I like about this new proposal that they've submitted to USDA is that it does take that multi-state approach. So, you know, they can really test it beyond California plants that they've tested it on so far. I think it's going to be pretty successful because I actually think we've built a pretty, um, pretty rigorous tool actually with the pre. So, but, but I do understand what you're saying. And the ASTM effort is great. I've kind of followed it because I know several other people that are part of that working group. And so they print, they post um, results. And uh, so they, it's, okay. What I actually get. That, what is the ASTM? I'm just trying, it's American Standards. And Materials. Testing. testing. American Standards. Society of, of Testing Materials. Yeah. And so you'll see like ASTM ratings for things like steel and all kinds of weird oh. stuff like that. But they, so they did a conference several, a workshop several years ago in Reno that I spoke at where they were starting to get interested in this issue, and then it never seemed to get off the ground until about three years ago when right. they started working on it again. And I wanted to participate, but I was just, I'm too busy. I don't have time for that. It's, it's fun. I don't get to do fun much anymore. So, yeah. But yeah, there's, there's that effort, and it'll be interesting to see how we merge all of these as we go forward. But a lot of the invasive plant councils are part of that effort, too, and so I think that's getting fed in as well to the people that are working on invasive species in each of the different regions. Red sweater? <laughs> well, it seems like you can answer this question as a plant producer and that almost every trait that you listed are things that we're interested in, like short juvenility, long with perennials, tons, yep. and stresses. Um, pests, fecundity in terms of how many flowers they produce, yep. production for traits like silk grass. So we, we want all of these. Traits. I know, that's. <laughs> it's, <laughs> and we're also really keen on bringing in. Um, related wild species to interject these specific traits. So I wonder if there's a tool that should be considered for how to be plant breeders bring out plant material to answer some of these questions um, as part of the development process before they become cultivar. Yeah, that's a really good point. I hadn't thought about people bringing things in to interest before, though. That's, mm -hmm. that's kind of an interesting concept. Um, it's true. I mean, I and I totally acknowledge that. I mean, talking about you know, is it a, about the alternatives? Is it a plant that the nurseries can propagate and you know have a lot of that is, you know, is it easy to propagate? Um, does it have a short juvenile period so they can get it to market more quickly, get the flowering plant out there because we know that's what sells in nurseries are the flowering plants. And I don't have a real answer to that except that, you know, the thing about invasive species is that they tend to have a lot of those traits, not just a few of them, but like all of them, or 75% of them at least. So you might still be able to get those traits that you want and just not, it wouldn't be invasive because it had so many of those reproductive traits or other traits. But it is, yeah, that's something I've got no really good answer for because it's true. You're selecting for things that are basically invasive species. So, yeah. Uh, another breeding-ish question. So um, for milder climates like the Pacific Northwest or the Deep South, where you can flower even in the summer and into the fall without any real fear of being frosted upon. Mm -hmm. Is there any interest in taking something like a butterfly bush and looking for variation in flowering time and trying to extend the flowering time or closer to frost so that uh, when the cold comes, the seeds actually get killed before um, they're able to mature? And I think that might be a more interesting or effective way of controlling seed flow versus sterility. Because again, if you have another pollen source coming in, that'll pollinate great seeds. Yeah. But if you push flower time back, Thank you. Uh, you could have, could potentially kill off seeds before they have to mature. Yeah. So just a thought as anyone's looking into just even within a species springs and flower. Yeah. No, but that's a really good point. One of the traits that we do know is associated, well, there's two traits that are associated with invasiveness, but they're highly correlated. So it's hard to tell which or both, but it's the length of the flowering time and the length of the fruiting time is positively associated with invasiveness. So if you can shorten that time, it might really help. And why that, it could be like, it could be the flowering is the key factor, which means that there's going to be a greater uh, potential for pollination over a period of time. Uh, if it's the, the fruiting, it could mean that it's going to be available to the seed dispersers for a longer period of time. But that is a trait that's associated with invasiveness. And if you could shrink that down, then that might be uh, a way of doing that same thing. Sorry, you guys are saying interesting things, so I wanted to make sure I got them captured here. There was a hand up over here, I think, somewhere. Nope. So, yeah, Sarah, I want you to clarify that the, the pre, uh, the plant risk evaluation, 
what what plants were they looking at? Were they only from California, Pacific Northwest? It wasn't across. The it wasn't even Pacific Northwest. It was just California. Just California. Because that's where their funding comes from. Uh, but it's it's a, I think the tool is going to be with very slight modifications, which is what this grant is going to look at what those modifications might be. With very slight modifications, it would be applicable. It's a lot like the Falong model, which uh, Doria Gordon got this paper published, and it was adapting the Australian model for Florida. And and I love Doria. So if any of you know her, I love Doria. But the main thing that they changed in that thing is the wording of instead of Australia, it says Florida. I mean, it was pretty much the exact same model with a couple different words in it, and and they got a paper out of it. So, um, <laughs> darn it, it never works for me. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I think it, it it's going to be like I think it's going to be like that, where you just make some mod modest tweaks for each different state, and it'll be applicable. So, who do you see using that? Well, depends on if you're sustainable conservation or you're me. Uh, sustainable conservation would like to basically have it be a, a for fee service because that's the business model that they're trying to develop. So you would subscribe to it um, as nursery people, plant breeders, or whatever. You would subscribe to it. That would give you access to all the previous ones that have been done, evaluations and database, as well as being able to request new ones being done. Um, and I think there's, I know Monrovia has subscribed to it although Monrovia is heavily involved in the plant right program. Mm -hmm. But Monrovia has subscribed to it and is using it, and they're hoping to get others, and they've gone around and talked to various conferences, uh, plant breeders and um, nursery green industry people. Um, it can, it's not that hard to use. The one thing about it is that it, it's much easier if you have access to academic literature. I will just put it out there. Anybody can use them. They're really not that hard a question, and they're really well explained. But getting that information, sometimes, sometimes it's, a, it's available easily over the web or you know, commonly known. But a lot of the times it is things where you need to be able to dig a little bit into the literature. And you also need to be able to interpret some terminology. And if you, a term like apomictic is thrown out, being able to understand what that means, you know, what the consequences of that are for seed production. Um, so it could be done by any academic. And if you, you know, it's on the web, you can go look at the... Um, the up. paper, yeah. But I was thinking like the here where we have like the Department of Agriculture that does regulation, I would, wouldn't you expect they would want to use it? Different states wouldn't want to use it to make decisions about what was sold in their state. They could certainly do that, yeah. I would again do some work on it to refine it and make sure it's accurate for that. But yeah, I think this, you know, Washington State, I mean, it's well digress and tell you a story. So holly is commercially grown in Washington uh, for Christmas time, you know, holly wreaths and stuff like that. And holly is also very invasive in the Pacific Northwest. And so there was a citizen's attempt to list it as a state noxious weed. I think we've got a regulator in the, the <laughs> room, so you may be sympathetic with this. Um, but there was, you know, people put up this big petition to list English holly, Alex aquifolium, as a noxious weed in Washington state. It was just going to be a Class C, which means... It's not necessarily enforced on, but the perception out there is that it's invasive, which it is. Uh, the holly industry is not a huge industry in Washington, but it's big enough and it's vocal enough that it was able to um, try to, to get a legislature, introduce a bill that says that anything that is commercially grown in Washington could not be listed as a noxious weed in Washington. Yeah, and that's like a whole Pandora's box where you don't want to go through that. So uh, so everyone like, got very political and... Uh, you know, chests were thumped and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and what it finally came down to was that it, it they modified the act, the, the proposed um, bill, that uh, the, a formal risk assessment had to be done before, which honestly, I'm part of the process and we use more of an expert's opinion, kind of discussing, debating, consensus kind of thing. And honestly, that works fine. But, but I'm okay with having to do a formal risk assessment, obviously. And, but so, but didn't the, did we use, did our, our Department of Agriculture use one of the many methods that are already available, including nature service method? And like, there's a whole bunch of these tools out there. No, they had to invent their own and do it. And, uh, you know, I think there's, there's these tools that are out there that people should be using that um, you don't need to do over and over again. So, you know, I don't know what you guys do here in Minnesota, if you have formal risk assessment and going into the process or not. We do, uh, yeah. but it's only in the regulation process not in the invasive species classification process. Oh. Um, so we're 
doing them slowly and piecemeal and one horticultural species at a time in order to engage the industry. Uh, in contrast to Wisconsin, which took a hundred of them and assessed them all over a period of two years. So my question is, what state's doing it right in terms of regulation and classification of regulated noxious weeds and identified invasive species, both? Probably Oregon, I would put up at this point. And I, I so in Washington, we have a great noxious weed law. We actually had the very first uh, law in the United States dealing with any kind of noxious weed was in Washington in 1884, and it was a bill to limit the spread of Canada thistle. So, uh, so we have a long history of doing that. We were one of the first states to start regulating on natural area weeds as opposed to just agricultural and, and pastoral pests. Uh, and we have more probably listed noxious weeds than any other uh, state, and we're well over 150 at this point, species that are listed. Um, but well, so that, yeah, I know, the states, I mean, the counties have to enforce on this, they're like, no more! <laughs> <laughs> but the hard thing is we try to take something off, and like the, something that's like class C, which is the lowest class, and, you know, just means that like oxide daisy, it's everywhere, and, you know, whatever. But there'll be some county that says, no, I want it left on, and then we leave it on, so then it just continues to grow. What we're trying to shrink are the number of A's, which are the ones where people have to control it on their property. Um, trying to keep those to the ones we really think we can eradicate. And then the bees, uh, which are ones where we regulate a little bit differently depending on where they grow. I think that approach, that tiered approach of absolutely not, you must prevent seed production and, you know, limit it to, you know, okay, you can grow. It's, it's widespread in this part of the state, so, okay, you don't have to enforce on it. But in this part of the state, it's not. And then the Class C, which is what if some county wants it, will leave it on the list. Um, which is what we were trying to do with Holly, and we couldn't even get to that point. Because there is a perception. I mean, when we listed English... Ivy, even though we went through a big process with the green industry, when it actually got listed, they were really ticked off about it because, you know, people were hearing, oh, now Ivy is a, a listed noxious weed. And so they then like turn against the ones that are not very harmful. Um, where we do not do things very well in Washington is our, so that's just control of noxious weeds. The uh, quarantine of noxious weeds, which means the selling and transport of them, is handled really completely differently by a different group, still Department of Agriculture, but it's a different group within Department of Agriculture. So you end up with these situations where something's listed as an noxious weed, but the nursery down here can still sell it. And that's just dumb. I mean, for Class C's maybe because, you know, there's so many of them out there anyway. But for a B or a B, an A or B designate, it doesn't make sense to do that. Oregon ties their, uh, their quarantine more tightly to the control. So it makes more, they've got a more integrated law than what we have here in Washington, what we have in Washington. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to say anything about, I don't know what you guys do here in Minnesota, so. Well, one point about the timber in Wisconsin is many of the cultivars of those plants are exempted. But the majority of them, any cultivar is exempted. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, with us, all the cultivars are included. But unless the basis for that is that they've got pretty good research on the species and a lot less research on the cultivars. Yeah. It's a reactive approach yeah, it rather is. than a prediction. Yeah. But it was what was politically doable. And that's sometimes what the reality is, is you do what's politically doable and go from there. Yeah. I was just curious if you could comment a little about uh, climate change on any of the species. Here in Minnesota, we are seeing a uh, shift in ecosystems with the fiction and the boreal forest from predictive movement of native species, we also then have changes in the climate for invasive species. And if we have species that are moving in, maybe from southern areas, who should they be considered invasive? Should they be allowed to come? How do you deal with climate? There's so many interesting questions around that. One that I don't see anybody addressing is biocontrol agents and their physiological tolerances versus the, the species that they're introduced. I mean, I'm wondering where that's going to go if there's that mismatch, because it, it could allow the invasive species to spread more, you know, farther north or in colder areas, but perhaps the biocontrol agent won't be able to move with it and will stay and begin to shift hosts. I think there's some really interesting questions about that, and I don't think anybody's looking at that. But it, it is really hard. And so, um, 
what I did a paper on assisted migration, which is the idea that some rare species may need to be carried up farther north or taken up the mountain or something like that because they won't be able to migrate fast enough to deal with climate change. And so I, my paper was on um, assisted migration and are those rare species likely to become invasive in their new place? And the answer to that is no, because they're <laughs> poor reproducers. That's why they're rare. So, uh, um, but it's an interesting question because natural area managers, and uh, there probably aren't any natural area managers in this group. So it's one of those questions of when something shows up that you know doesn't belong on your preserve, whatever it is you're managing, but it's something from farther south, do you treat it as an invasive species? And we actually at a conference came up with the term resisted migration, because the idea that these plants are trying to migrate and we're resisting, they're, they're doing that, we're removing them as an invasive species. And it's, it is a really interesting question, and one of my graduate students is just starting just starting, like really just starting a project where she's going to be looking at um, herbarium spe specimens or to see what's historically been found in the Pacific Northwest and then, you know, sort of determine what a baseline is. Already we're picking up a couple things that are coming in where we're kind of going, hmm. So I think that's a really interesting question. As far as where the invasives are going to do, I mean, these are plants that usually have a really broad environmental tolerance. So, I mean, I think they're going to keep moving as much as they can and keep pushing forward and moving northward and yeah, and then of course there's increased climate, uh, increased carbon dioxide, which can increase certain things like um, some of the secondary compounds in them. Uh, you know, there was that study that came out about poison oak or poison ivy and the urushal, and how it increased the uh, increased CO2 increases the amount of chemicals that cause the uh, dermal abrasion, dermal issues. Um, so it can introduce, you know, increase potentially secondary compounds, which could make the plants less palatable to insects, which might increase their invasive ability. I mean, there's a lot of interesting things like that and with, with climate change, such as the temperature. There's other factors, too. Okay, well, we're at, thank you, Sarah. Let's give Sarah <laughs> We're going to set up now for our panel discussion. So as we're doing that, we have six panelists that are going to come up here. We'll take a two or three minute break, get a cup of coffee. Uh, the restroom facility, female is there, male is the other direction on this floor. And we'll have our panelists come up here and get set up. So. And if you didn't pull out a name tag, take a chance oh. to do that. That's your chance to win a door prize as well. So. Yeah, we'll start the panel with a couple door prize drawings. Yeah, I love that. So, you guys can take a seat up here. Yeah, yeah. 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 It would make sense. That makes sense. I'm gonna need you know which one it is. Tell you which which one it is. Yeah. 